Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Dollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is writer John Zer Platten. John, welcome to Comic Culture. Great to see you, Terrence. Thanks for having me. Um, really excited to talk with you today about uh, what we've got going on. Well, what you've got going on is a new comic called Revolvers, which I had the opportunity to read the first issue. Without giving too much away, it's, it's a noir comic, it's a supernatural comic, and it's a little bit of horror. So when you're working in the, all of those different genres and making them into one, uh, one tight story, how do you sort of you know, make sure you hit all those right buttons? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, the challenge uh, here on this particular comic is that we were kind of pushing a number of boundaries and we wanted to, uh, we wanted to still have a unified vision for the piece. Um, the story itself is about uh, basically a cop who may or may not be investigating his own death. And he ends up in an alternate reality sort of purgatory called the moratorium. And so it touches on elements of properties like John Wick, Hellraiser, Michael Mann's Heat <laughs> played, a, played, a, played a role in sort of some of the cop stuff. And so it was kind of trying to bring that all together into a unified vision that made sense. That was really the challenge. And then, um, you know, create a compelling story with interesting characters. For me, more than anything else, uh, your story has to be grounded in characters you either empathize with or sympathize with, or at least uh, want to know how their story plays out. And and Hampton is a, the main uh, protagonist in the story. Hampton is a uh, a good cop, but not necessarily a good man. And that's the the interesting part of his character is him coming to terms with his failings. Those failings often present themselves in very violent ways. Uh, and so it was a really fun book to write. I enjoyed it immensely. And uh, I was very fortunate that I had a great artist named Christian Dabari, who uh, was my partner in crime on this. And, uh, and he was able to bring, uh, bring the imagery uh, to my words. And uh, Super excited about it. And when you're working with an artist uh, like Christian, mm -hmm. it's, it's got to be, um, I guess, when you're seeing the, the pages come in and you see what you're writing and he, he's interpreting, um, does that make you sort of rethink, oh, maybe if I turn a little bit in this direction, it will uh, tweak the dialogue here. It can, you know, play into the art? Or are you just sort of saying, well, you know, he's interpreted the script already. I'm just going to go with it as it was written. Yeah, I had basically written all four of the books uh, before Christian started to do the art. But as he was uh, doing the art, I was kind of going back and doing some some edits and some revisions uh, to the script. Christian brought a real rock and roll aesthetic to the piece that I didn't initially see. But when he uh, sent over his first character uh, concepts, for me to look at and we were just kind of reviewing and, and checking everything out he had this real kind of like gritty yeah like i said for lack of a better term kind of rock and roll vibe to it and he's he's very much a fan of 80s horror uh grindhouse uh body horror the same sort of stuff that that i'm a fan of we we sort of had a a, a shorthand language we could speak to each other and uh and when i saw his initial imagery i was thinking kind of more you know kind of uh, law and order type uh, characters, you know, kind of that's what I kind of had bouncing around in my head. And and as I said, a little bit of inspiration from from Michael Mann and his uh, his crime dramas. And then I saw what Christian was doing and he was going with this really kind of very interesting aesthetic that I just said, oh, man, this is so good. You know, let's let's embrace this. A lot of my work with Christian was really just a an issue of as stuff was coming in, uh, encouraging him to 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 go as dark as I was willing to go. And, and, and uh, you know, he just came up with some amazing visuals and uh, it was a real pleasure to work with him and his, his colorist, uh, Simon Goh, uh, to, uh, to see this thing come to life. Looking at the artwork, it has a, I guess, I don't wanna say retro, but an old school feel. It's not as, mm -hmm. as tight as we're used to seeing contemporary comics where every little detail is in the page. A lot is implied. There's a lot of, of shadow. There's a lot of the reader is supposed to draw their own conclusion as to a lot of this stuff. But it is set in a real world uh, city, Detroit. In trying to capture the feel of Detroit as a writer and seeing the artist interpretation of Detroit as sort of a character, how does that influence you and how do you influence it? Great question, because we spent a lot of time thinking about, OK, where is this story going to be set? Uh, the story is ultimately a story of both despair and hope. And uh, we were looking for a place that made sense 
uh, my father was from Detroit and I've uh, kind of watched uh, with, with both horror and amazement as, as Detroit has evolved over the past years. And so we were thinking of this idea, okay, well, what would be a present day ghost town? And we started thinking Detroit is almost like a, a ghost metropolis in some ways. And so we wanted the city to play a role. And so once we got to that point, we thought, okay, well, let's make the city of Detroit a character. And the, and the interesting thing about Hampton is he loves Detroit. It's, it's his home and he absolutely loves the city. So in no way did I want to sort of like denigrate the city. I just wanted to have the, the ability to use a city that's kind of in this awkward stage in its existence um, and go, okay, what if that town was filled with ghosts? What if that town was filled with, uh, with you know, an, an alternate reality that sort of hid below the surface? And could that alternate reality that's hiding below the surface actually be influencing in some way uh, what we're seeing happen to that city? Um, and so I found it kind of the, the, the city of Detroit and, and the location to be a story of its own and very metaphorical for what we were doing with the rest of the story. So once I saw Simon start to bring the city to life as well, I just went, yeah, this, this was the right decision. And the, um, there are some various uh, locations in the city itself that do play significantly into the story um, when, you, when you get into the later books. And what's really interesting, uh, again, about Detroit is that it, it as you say in the, the book, this was the, the engine basically that, that fueled the U.S. Army, the U.S. Navy, the Air Force during World War II. Basically, that's what beat the Axis powers. And you yeah. write about this using uh, captions, uh, which we don't see too often in contemporary comics. So I'm wondering, you know, Frank Miller will do it where it's first person, but this is that, that traditional yeah. third person uh, omniscient narrator. So, you know, when you're going and doing something that isn't done too much these days, is, is that, again, that conscious choice because you're looking to do something different, or is this just a great storytelling tool? Hopefully it's both. Uh, but, but yeah, there was a challenge early on in the story. When I first started writing it, there was no narrator. There was nobody, there was no voice, you know, no voice of God talking you through parts of the story. And uh, as I got to the end, and it was kind of, I, I knew where I was going with the story. I knew how I wanted to wrap up. Um, I realized that uh, a significant character in the story could actually be the narrator. And so you will find out later who that voice belongs to. Um, and, uh, and for me, it allowed me to, um, you know, when you're, when you're doing a comic, uh, sometimes you have to uh, be concise in both the words you choose and the story you're telling and the way the imagery is gonna play out. You don't get uh, the luxury of, you know, adding an additional 10 pages to make everything uh, flow. And so having, having uh, a character that can bridge some of those gaps became an essential part of the story. It allowed me to compress some of the bigger ideas by having a character basically describe uh, how that was playing out within the context of the narrative. And so, uh, so yeah, that was, a, that was a, both a creative choice and a sort of structural choice uh, for the comic. Um, I also like, uh, I like getting in people's heads. I like people uh, musing. I like to listen to people's thoughts. And that's what you're basically reading. You're going to find out uh, as you move forward with the books, you're going to find out you're actually in somebody's head. And uh, yeah, and as to the city itself, Detroit was absolutely essential. Uh, you know, um, it was it was it was the engine, uh, certainly for a lot of what was happening in the United States from a, you know, manufacturing and technological point of view. And so it's, it's fall from grace, if you will, for lack of a better term, uh, is, is a tragedy in and of itself that, that we explore in the book as well. We've talked about how this is a, a different type of comic and you're working with a different type of publisher. You're working with Image and the Top Cow uh, imprint. So how do you go about working with uh, or choosing to work with Top Cow? Yeah, so I have a long time uh, friendship uh, with Matt Hawkins over at Top Cow. And uh, the company that I'm a part of, a company called Epitome, is run by a man named uh, Richard Leibowitz. And Rich is a long time friend of mine, too. We go back 25 years. And when we first started uh, exploring things we were going to do together and IP development, we we're doing a lot of stuff in the game space. 
And we were looking at uh, ways that we could start, you know, putting some of these IPs on their feet and getting a feel for how they would work. And one of our initial reactions was, well, maybe we do some comics. So we uh, reached out to Matt. Uh, fortunately, Matt was terrific. He was uh, very supportive. Um, and he liked uh, the IP we were bringing to him, including uh, St. Mercy and, and Revolvers, as well as another comic called Colossus, uh, which we did and Matt wrote. Um, and uh, so it was really great getting to work with Matt and his team over at, at Top Cow. Uh, they were super supportive. And as this was, you know, sort of my first forays in the comic space, even though I've been writing for 30 years in video games and film and television and that sort of thing, um, you know, Matt kind of helped me through the process. Uh, and, you know, writing for a comic is... The, the truth of writing is is a universal truth. So story is story, regardless of the platform or medium you're going to. Uh, but every medium has its own unique needs um, and uh, expectations on the half on behalf of the uh, the audience that you're trying to reach. And Matt's insights into that and his his guidance uh, was truly invaluable to me as I started to put this together. So it was great having a pro like Matt on my side. To, to kind of get me up to speed on some of the uh, some of the elements of comics that uh, I wasn't as familiar with as I, you know, a more experienced uh, comic writer would be. But I think that also worked to my advantage because I was doing things that other comic writers probably wouldn't. That drove everybody a little bit crazy at times, but, but from that craziness, I think uh, came something really original. And so uh, th I think that's something that, that we can be really proud of is that, you know, uh, we're doing things uh, and telling stories in ways uh, in the medium that other people don't. And I, f I find that fascinating. I had the opportunity to speak to uh, Matt Hawkins uh, last year. And he is a gentleman who approaches comics not so much in that bombastic Stan Lee sort of, you know, true believers kind of way. He's more of a curator and he's looking for interesting products. And, and you mentioned Colossus, which I thought was just a, a fascinating comic. Uh, I had the chance to read that as well. But you mentioned that you have worked in video games and you've worked in television. So how does writing, I mean, yes, story is story, character is character, but yeah. how do you sort of go between those disciplines and make sure that you're able to tell a great story and still play into the strengths of that medium? Yeah, it's a, it's a really uh, solid question because it's something I struggle with. Um, you know, when I'm uh, working on a project, when I'm writing, whether I'm writing other people's IPs or writing my own, uh, I basically ask myself three questions constantly. And the first thing is, what am I trying to say? You know, so in this story, what what am I really trying to say? And then the second question I'm always asking myself is, who am I trying to tell? And then the final question I'm asking myself is, and how am I going to tell them? Right. So those three questions form the foundation of what I write. And depending on the medium that I'm in, those questions change. Uh, so um, if you're writing in the video game space, you may write massive scripts. I've written 1,000 page scripts, 2,000 page scripts. I've written uh, in a single game, maybe eight to 10,000 lines of dialogue. Um, and you're, uh, you're approaching that in an entirely different way. Even though you're creating a mass amount of content, the way that content is gonna be delivered to who you're trying to speak to uh, might be in very fast, very quick engaging segments because the expectation of a game, uh, a video game audience is I'm a player, I get to control. When do I start pushing buttons? And so you have to understand that the expectation of that audience is entirely different than say the expectation of a comic book audience who is sitting down and wants to read the book and they're gonna spend some time with it. And they're probably gonna spend some time even after they read it, going back and maybe rereading sections or looking at the art or whatever it might be. So those expectations are entirely different. The way they're uh, engaging with the content is entirely different. Um, and as you said, uh, the, the truth of story is the truth of story. You know, you need engaging characters. You need story arcs. You need setups and payoffs. You need journeys for the characters to go on. But understanding the audience you're, you're reaching, I think, is a key component of, of creating the content. Uh, about it was probably six or seven months ago, I saw a thing on Facebook that basically said, explain what you do for a living in five words or less. Right? And so I wrote, I create people and problems. 
And that is the essence of a writer. That is the essence of writer does. Uh, you create people and then you put them into difficult situations and then you see how they respond to those situations and can they get themselves out of them. And uh, if you can do that and you can understand your process by which you get there, then you can, you can kind of endlessly generate stories. It just becomes how do you modify that story to work for the audience you're trying to reach? And that, that for me is, is a key component that I'm always thinking of when I'm, when I'm you know, writing, when I'm working on my craft. I've read that um, some scholars are predicting that, you know, uh, video games will be the next sort of narrative, um, and it's probably come true already, uh, narrative uh, storytelling method that really engages the audience. It becomes that, that new cinema that, you know, you can play a game multiple different times and tell a different story every time you play it. So as you're writing, as you said, 8,000 lines of dialogue, knowing that some of them will never be heard by the player. Um, are you thinking, you know, what the second time they play this game or the third time they play this game, they're going exactly. to get another element in another piece? Yeah, exactly. And, and, and the challenge to the, you know, to the challenge to doing that is a lot of that dialogue is instruction hidden within narrative, right? Because uh, a game player is always going to be looking to extract information from all of those, uh, all of those, uh, you know, interactions that you're, you're having, whether it's a cutscene or whether it's, uh, it's interactive dialogue or anything in between, uh, they're looking for information. So you have to not only provide story, uh, but you have to be very uh, judicious in, in how you use your words because you don't want to send somebody off on a journey that, that they can't complete. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. It's 100% a challenge. Um, you know, you spend a lot of time sort of uh, juggling balls in your own head of like, okay, this character is there. Have they seen this sequence yet? Uh, and we do, we do map it out. So there is kind of a, uh, you know, a roadmap, a spreadsheet that we can follow, but, uh, but yeah, it, 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 it presents its own unique, uh, set of issues that you have to deal with when you're, when you're creating that content. Um, as to games being the medium of the future, I think that's 100 percent true. Um, I think uh, if, if you define games as interactive, anything interactive, anything in which there is agency on the on the part of the uh, of the person that's being uh, being entertained. Uh, so rather than a viewer, a player, um, those those kind of experiences, I think, are the future. The next generation of folks that are that are. Uh, coming into not only uh, defining medium, uh, defining the mediums that they want to ex explore for their entertainment, but but actually purchasing. Those folks are more likely to watch, you know, Snapchat than they are to watch traditional television. They're more likely uh, uh, to uh, to be engaged in a in a TikTok video uh, than they might be on a video they would watch on YouTube. And so the the uh, the medium is constantly evolving, constantly changing, um, and you know our job as creators is to understand where they are and where they want to be, and what they enjoy, and and get there, and provide them that that entertainment that they're looking for. And as a writer, someone who's worked in television, where writing a script is a particular format, uh, with you know actors who know their part, and and you probably don't have to get too in depth with with some visuals, especially if it's let's say a sitcom or something like that, mm -hmm. to a video game where maybe you are getting really detailed with what's in the background because you're you're having to create that whole uh, environment and then to a comic where you're again sort of going into uh, what the artist has to put on the page you know how do you sort of work with that discipline knowing how how in-depth or not in-depth you have to go with describing you know a kitchen it's it's a real challenge because you know if you're writing traditional screenplays if you're doing stuff that's for traditional media uh there's kind of this rule that people talk about that, that basically uh, boils down to don't direct on the page, right? Just tell your story uh, and let the director or let the other folks that are gonna be dealing with bringing your story and putting it on its feet, they'll figure out where to place the camera. And then you, uh, and then you write a comic book where you 100% have to direct on the page. You're calling out panel by panel imagery. Uh, and, and like I said, I was fortunate enough to, to work with, with, Simon, uh, with, uh, with Christian and Simon, uh, and they know how to lay out a story. They know how to direct on the page. So I could say, look, you know, panel, 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 half splash, and then, uh, you know, 
eight out of 10 times, I might get that from Christian, but a couple of times he's got, no, I've got my own idea of how I want this to go and I'm going to do it. I'm going to draw it the way I see it. And he was always right. So I never fought him on it. Um, but yeah, there's that whole sort of, you know, mindset having to change where you're trying to explain everything that you might see in that particular uh, panel. Um, whereas, as you've said, in, you know, in a, if you're writing a sitcom, uh, you know, the environment's already set up. So you're just writing the jokes. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's again, it's that transition from, from, you know, platform to platform uh, that you have to pay attention to. And so, yeah, there were a lot of, uh, a, a lot of new tricks this old dog had to learn because uh, I, I had to break habits that, uh, that I've been using for years because, you know, that's the way you're supposed to do it. Um, uh, and then in video game writing, it can it can vary wild wildly. So I tend to write all my video game stuff in traditional screenplay format, but then it may get converted into all kinds of other formats. I've had to write in databases and spreadsheets and you know Word documents and Google Docs. And usually fortunate and that the people that I work with understand that you know final dra final draft is my is my jam of choice, and I like to start there. And then uh, some companies like the the folks at Frontier Developments who uh, do Jurassic World built a custom extractor so they can basically take all my final draft scripts and convert them into the uh, Excel spreadsheets that they need for, uh, you know, basically coding. And when the, when we go to do voice recording, oftentimes we'll we'll do it out of out of a spreadsheet too, just because the script would be so big otherwise. That's interesting. I never thought about the voice actors having to do. I mean, obviously they're going to have to perform. It's sort of, I guess, like doing right. a voice for an animated feature. Um, but I'm imagining for a video game, it's got to be a little bit trickier because you do have, in, in some cases, 8,000 lines of dialogue that have to be covered. Yeah, and you have to, and, and you have to provide, you know, for a performer, they want to know the context of what they're, of the scene that they're in, right? And, and that scene may be jumping around. Uh, they may not know what's happening, you know, what the player did just before this line kicks in or how this line is directing the player to do the next bit of action they need to take. So it's really important. So in addition to... Uh, being with the actor to help them, you know, tweak a line, make sure it's working for them. Uh, we also need to give them the, the basically the purpose of the line, what it's what it's what it's providing for the game. Um, uh, actors, uh, for me, are are the essential element of anything that I write because I'm not writing for a reader. I'm writing for a performer, and I can't. Uh, you know, in many cases, I can't get the script over the finish line. I really need a talented actor uh, to bring all of their skills to bear on it and, and bring it to the finish line. So I tell everybody, even on my best day, I can only get 80% of the way there. I still need, you know, the incredible talents of, of professionals that know what they're doing, uh, voice directors and engineers and obviously actors uh, to, uh, to bring the material to life. And the really exciting part for me as a creative is when I hear really talented people uh, playing with a line of dialogue I wrote at four in the morning and they elevate it and make it something so much better than what I had in my head or what I was able to put on the screen and you know through the keyboard and they just run with it and turn it into something beyond what I could have imagined and uh, that's that's sort of how it works in video games and in many ways that's what happened with uh, revolvers uh, in the comic was you know, I had this one vision in my head as I was writing it, and then uh, Christian's vision <laughs> kind of infected my brain with all the amazing stuff he was doing. And so it was really exciting to see those pages come in because I was like, yeah, um, the, you know, I'm getting the same thrill that I was getting, you know, being in a recording session. It's, it's fascinating. We, we have just about a minute or so left before we have to wrap up sure. our conversation. But working collaboratively in television, in video games, and in comics, it, it's got to be great to have that, uh, that knowledge that there's always going to be somebody there to pick you up and make your work even better. Yeah, absolutely. No, you, 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 every entertainment medium is a collaborative medium, and you have to trust that the people around you uh, uh, know what they're doing, uh, that they have the skills to do it, and then you you let their talent shine, you know, rather than rather than trying to impose a vision, I try and share a vision and then let everybody else uh, play in that sandbox and anything that they can do to make uh, to make the project better. You know, that's only to the good. And so uh, so, yeah, I love the process of collaboration. You know, my favorite thing to do is to be in a room and have a, a you know, a dry erase board and a head full of ideas and just start jamming with the team 
and seeing where it takes us. That's, to me, one of the most enjoyable parts of the job. Well, John, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to talk with me today. The half hour has flown by. Well, thanks. It was great talking with you, too. You know, I'm, I'm really passionate about this stuff. Uh, I love writing. I, I feel very fortunate that I get to do it for a living. Um, and, uh, and I'm always excited to share what I've got going on with everybody else. Well, thank you again. And thanks to everyone at home for watching Comic Culture. We will see you again soon.